Hi there, thanks for joining me. Today I'm going to be talking again about an example of functional misspecification. And in this example, we're going to be talking about um, the example of how car sales for a particular car depends on the price. And sort of thinking about some sort of population model, um, we might expect that sort of car sales or, or demand for cars follow some sort of path like that. So obviously it's a downward sloping demand curve, but it's not a straight line. So sort of writing this functionally, another way of saying this is that car sales is equal to some sort of constant A times uh, P to the power beta times some uh, the number E to the power um, the error. The reason I've written the sort of error structure in this form will become clear a bit later, um, but now just sort of bear with me. So in this sort of uh, above model, we're going to find that beta is going to be less than zero because uh, sort of writing this another way, we could write that car sales is equal to alpha e to the u all over p to the modulus of beta. So this model says that as um, p tends to infinity, car sales tend to zero. So it's, it's following this sort of curve here. So why might we think that there's this sort of curve shape rather than just a straight line, a, a straight demand curve line? Well, when the price of a car is quite low, let's say it's sort of of order a few hundred pounds, a small increase in the price of that car um, probably causes quite a significant change in demand um, because that change is quite large in percentage terms. Whereas when the price of a car is, is let's say, relatively high, a small change in the price of that car um, will probably have not well, a, a change in price of that car in sort of $100 terms is probably not going to have that much effect on the demand for cars at that sort of price. Uh, the key insight here being that the sort of car um, demand depends more on percentage changes in prices than it does on absolute changes in prices. So we can think about if we had sort of a sample of data so we had sort of car sales at a whole sort of for one particular car brand at different car dealerships throughout the country, let's say. Um, we might have sort of data which looks something like this. So it's sort of following our sort of downward sloping demand curve, um, but it's definitely not a straight line. So let's say we didn't actually chart our data because we weren't sort of um, being absolutely correct in our sort of way we proceeded to do econometrics, then perhaps we would fit a straight line which looks something like this, um, where we sort of fitted a linear model. So car sales being equal to alpha plus beta times price plus some error u. So beta here would be less than zero. Uh, but notice that beta from our sort of estimated straight line is just the gradient and it's gonna be constant um, is completely independent of the price. So when the price of a car is really low, perhaps beta underestimates the effect of small changes in price on car sales. Whereas when, B, when, when price is quite high, perhaps beta overestimates the effect of car sales on prices. So again, we by estimating this linear model, we have functionally misspecified the sort of true population process, which is this sort of power law distribution. And because of that, beta is actually quite misleading. The parameter which we've estimated is giving us quite a misleading um, uh, insight into what's actually going on in the population. So, okay, we, we've, we can, we've discovered that beta is um, quite misleading. How can we actually estimate a, a better model? Because this model up here is inherently nonlinear. It's nonlinear in the parameter because it's p to the power beta. So how can we actually estimate a linear model? Because remember, least squares requires our model to be linear in parameters. Well, the answer is, if I just take the log of both sides of this population process, I would get something which looks like log car sales being equal to log A plus beta times log P plus U. Um, and in this sort of above derivation, I've used the fact that log a, B, log two numbers multiplied together is log A plus log B. Oh, log B, sorry. And also that log um, P to the beta in this case is equal to beta log P. So notice that 
this um, model which I've got down here, or this sort of way of representing our power law distribution, is actually linear in the logs. If I was to plot log P against log car sales, it would actually be a straight line with gradient beta, um, which would be a constant. So what does beta represent in this sort of log model? Well, it represents uh, the elasticity of demand. It represents the percentage change in um, car sales. Uh, for a 1% change in price. And this is likely to be a much better model of what's going on um, because of the fact that it, this says that this model says that it's not actual absolute changes in the price which affect demand for cars, it's percentage changes in the price. So when the um, price of the car is quite small, um, so somewhere up in this part of the curve, small changes in the price actually have quite a large effect on the car demand because it's a large, uh, percentage change in price. Whereas here, if I sort of increase the car price by $100, let's say, that's very small in percentage terms. So that leads to a very small um, in, or decrease in car sales. So by estimating our model in log form, we will actually get data which would fit, or we would actually get a line which fits our data a lot better. And if we were to translate that back into sort of um, non-logged form, um, perhaps it would follow some sort of distribution like that. So it would give us a much better an idea as to what the effect of price changes were on car sales.